Hello, I'm Dr. David Clark. I lecture in theology at the University of Roehampton in London. The title of this podcast is Theology and Identity. In this episode, we want to look at how Hebrew notions of death and the afterlife changed and developed across the text of the Hebrew Bible. In the earliest traditions of the Old Testament, it very much appears that the Hebrew people believed that death was the end. Nowhere in the book of Genesis or the law of Moses do we see any specific indications that there is life after death. As we read through the wisdom and poetic literature, in some places there are hints that there may be life after death, but then in other places the authors seem to clearly affirm, again, death is the end. It is not until the era after the Babylonian exile, what is known as Second Temple Judaism, that very clear notions of resurrection, final judgment, and eternal reward or punishment start to appear in the text. Our aim today is to better understand how belief in the afterlife developed among the people of Israel and how this shaped their identity. As we do this, it will be important to bear in mind the methodology we've been using throughout this series. I'm not reading the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament or later Christian doctrine. I'm not looking for signs to confirm all that we as Christians believe about life after death today. Rather, we are trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the original Hebrew audience. We want to be mindful of what they knew and what they didn't know at various stages of their theological development. So let's begin our study. The first question that we want to address is, are there any suggestions that there is life after death in the first five books of the Bible or the Torah? To discern this, the key question is, how did God say he would reward the righteous, and how did he say that he would punish the sinful? Does the idea of judgment after death ever come into play? The short answer is no. Throughout our survey, we've been talking about the promise that God made to Abraham and how that is the central theme of the Old Testament scriptures. God had said to Abraham, I will make your name great, and I will multiply your offspring. In you will all the nations of the earth be blessed, and I will give your descendants this land. But nowhere in the promises made to Abraham is there word of life after death. In the patriarchal era, reward for righteousness was not understood as eternal life in heaven. The afterlife of Abraham would be lived through his children. The name of Abraham, the testimony of Abraham, would live forever through his family. So if we go a bit further in the text of the Pentateuch, we find that in Deuteronomy 28, Moses laid out for the people of Israel the rewards that they would receive if they kept the covenant and the curses that would come upon them if they didn't. So here are some of the rewards. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herd, the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not go down, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. And then we see some of the curses. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb. Cursed shall you be when you come in and when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, frustration, and all that you undertake to do. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground. You shall father sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. And so, through this brief survey of Deuteronomy 28, what I want to emphasize is that in all of these verses, every blessing for obedience is something that occurs on earth, in the lives of the people of Israel and their children. And every curse for disobedience is something that occurs on earth, in the lives of the people of Israel and their children. 
In the law of Moses, there is no mention of any type of personal reward or punishment that occurs for individual people after they have died. So it very much appears that at this time, people believed that death was the end. Now let's move beyond the Torah and have a look at some passages from the poetic and wisdom literature. Here we find that there were many Hebrew authors who lamented the fact that at the moment of death, they would cease to exist. In Job 7, it reads, Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him any more. For now I shall lie in the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be. And then in chapter 14, Job says, Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake and as a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. And then we read in Psalm 88, Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? And then we'll look at one more passage on this theme from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So in all of these texts, we're seeing examples from the Old Testament showing that the overarching view among the Hebrew people was that death was the end. So then, how exactly did ideas of resurrection, of final judgment, of heaven and hell develop? The answer is that among the Hebrew people, ideas about the afterlife developed slowly over time. We can say that they came into full fruition during the era of the exile and the second temple. We note that beliefs about the afterlife weren't established by doctrinal decree. There wasn't a prophet or a priest who all of a sudden announced, there is life after death. There is no Old Testament text that lays out the detail of this theology in a systematic way. Rather, what we see is that the idea of life after death began among certain people as a hunch or a hope, and then, over time, it became a certainty. Ideas have a history. Once again, they develop over time. And in the Bible, just because we see some people starting to suspect that there may be something more after death, that doesn't mean that everyone everywhere came to the conclusion at the same time. So what I want to focus on in the history of Judaic thought are two lines upon which this idea developed. The first is the argument for eschatological justice, and the second point is the argument for eternal relationship. So on the idea of justice. It's interesting to note that throughout most of the Old Testament text, we don't really see the idea of martyrs. There were prophets and other faithful people who suffered for their faith. But when we think of a martyr, we think of persecution, an oppressive government power that pressures people to apostatize and deny their faith. 
and this government power punishes those who do not comply. For most of the Old Testament era, this type of political setting really didn't exist. It wasn't until the time of Greek rule in Israel that the Jewish people as a whole began to experience oppression and persecution under the rule of a foreign power. The primary canonical text that emerges from this period is the book of Daniel, and this can be read in harmony with other important texts from the same period known as the books of Maccabees. It was when the Greek rulers started clamping down on the practice of Judaism and when many Jewish people started resisting that we see for the first time the idea of mass martyrdom and apostasy taking place. And this then opened the door to questions about what happens after death. Would there be a reward for those Jews who valiantly died defending their faith? Would there be a punishment for those who turned away from the faith and denied their identity? Or would the ultimate fate of both martyrs and the apostates be exactly the same? Would they both just pass into Sheol without any punishment or any reward for their deeds in life? So let's take a look at the historical context. During the era of Greek rule in the second century BC, there was a really nasty ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes. It says in 1 Maccabees 1, Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, and that all should give up their particular customs. Many, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath, and the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary to profane Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. And the king added, And whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. So it says, They erected a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. The books of the law that they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Anyone found possessing the book of the covenant or anyone who adhered to the law was condemned to death by decree of the king. So what we see here is a mass persecution of the Jewish people with many people turning away from the faith. But there were also many Jews who stood firm. In 1 Maccabees 1, it says, But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the holy covenant. And they did die. Very great wrath came upon Israel. In the book of 2 Maccabees, we see an example of this martyrdom the story of a Jewish mother who watched her seven sons die. In chapter 7, it says, It happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compelled by the king under torture with whips and thongs to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. One of them acting as their spokesman said, For we are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. The king fell into a rage and gave orders to have pans and cauldrons heated. These were heated immediately, and he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman be cut out, and that they scalp him and cut his hands off and his feet, while the rest of the brothers and the mother looked on. When he was utterly helpless, the king ordered them to take him into the fire, still breathing, and to fry him in a pan. But the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die nobly, And so this poor woman watched her sons die one by one. And then after the seventh son was killed, the text says, Although she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, she bore it with good courage. Filled with a noble spirit, she reinforced her woman's reasoning with a man's courage and said to them, I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath 
nor I who set in order the elements within each of you. Therefore, the creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of humankind and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. So this mother refused to accept the idea that this was the end for her sons. Now, where did this idea of resurrection come from? She didn't quote any scriptures to support her belief, but rather she simply trusted that in his righteousness, Yahweh would vindicate the death of her sons. So what we see happening here is that persecution, martyrdom, and apostasy are pushing the people of Israel to seriously think about what happens after death. In their concept of God's justice, they simply cannot accept that the Jews who turned away from their faith and the Jews who painfully died defending their beliefs and practices would ultimately meet the same fate. There had to be life after death. There had to be judgment. There had to be justice. And so N.T. Wright sums it up in this way. Israel's God will reverse the actions of the wicked pagans and raise the martyrs and the teachers who kept Israel on course to a glorious life. Simultaneously, he will raise their persecutors to a new existence. Instead of remaining in the decent obscurity of Sheol or the dust, they will face perpetual public obloquy. So in sum, what we're seeing here is the first line of progression upon which this idea of life after death developed, what I have called the argument for eschatological justice. But this isn't the only thread to follow in the Old Testament on how beliefs about the afterlife were progressing. Another concept in formation was the argument for eternal relationship. One of the greatest declarations of Hebrew spirituality that we find particularly evident in the Psalms is the idea that the steadfast love of Yahweh never dies. Kitov Adonai Leolam Kasdu, for the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. For many Judeans, this was a declaration of faith in God's commitment to his promises. He loved the nation of Israel, and his love and his faithfulness to his people would never come to an end. The amazing love of God would follow the people of Israel from generation to generation into eternity. But for some people among the faithful of Israel, this wasn't enough. King David is an example. He praised and blessed God for the faithfulness that had been promised to his offspring. But for David, the love of Yahweh wasn't just about his faithfulness to the people of Israel across the generations. The love of Yahweh was also about his deep personal relationship with individual people. The burning question in David's life was this. If the love of the Lord endures forever, then why must the moment come when I am separated from that love? How is it that God's love can go on into eternity and I won't be there to experience it? David reached the conclusion that if the deep, intimate love of Yahweh for him endures forever, then it has to be the case that he will rise again after he dies so that he can continue enjoying that amazing love. It is particularly in Psalm 17 that we see David wrestling with these ideas. I'm going to give a paraphrase of the first 14 verses, and then we're going to focus in on verse 15. In the first section of this psalm, David is lamenting the injustices of this life, and he is staking his claim on the righteousness of God. In verses 1 and 2, he is saying, God, you who see justice, vindicate my cause. In verses 3 to 5, you know me, you've tested me, you know that I am committed to living righteously. 6 and 7, 
I know that I can count on you. You are the refuge and savior of those who flee from the wicked to find protection in you. Verse 8, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. And then in 9 to 14, wicked men surround me, they have no pity, they speak arrogantly, they're eager to pounce. These are men who experience abundance in this world, their bellies are full of treasure, they have many children, they pass on their wealth from generation to generation. But then in verse 15, David really lays out why he is different from these wicked men. They have their reward on earth. But this is what David says. But as for me, in righteousness, I will look upon your face. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, for I shall see you as you really are. What's going on here? is that David has come to the realization that things will never be that great in this life. We will always have problems, we will always have enemies, and the fact that we're striving to live holy lives is not a guarantee that life will be easy. We will look at the lives of the wicked and will realize that oftentimes for them, everything is going great. David's hope for deliverance is not based on the idea that someday the wicked will be punished. His hope for deliverance is not based on the idea that someday he will be rewarded on this earth for his faithfulness. David's hope for deliverance is that someday, after he dies, he will rise again. And his reward will not be mansions of gold or crowns. His reward will be to see the face of his God, to see Yahweh for who he really is. And this is all David could ever want or hope for. This is the moment when his soul will be satisfied, when he knows that he will live in love relationship with Yahweh forever. So I'll read verse 15 again. But as for me, In righteousness, I will look upon your face. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, for I shall see you as you really are. What we see here is that this is the argument for eternal relationship, and this is what leads David to the conclusion that there must be life after death. Because he lives in love relationship with God, He can't imagine that relationship ever coming to an end. And because he longs so deeply to see the face of his God, to know Yahweh for who he really is, he can't imagine that a loving God would ever deny to him the fulfillment of that desire. So in conclusion, let's reflect for a moment on what this means for us today. In this episode, we've been tracing the story of how the Hebrews slowly came to the understanding that there is life after death. There is judgment, and there will be eternal punishment for the wicked and eternal reward for the righteous. On the one hand, we've seen that this conclusion was based on their trust in the character of Yahweh. In times of persecution, when some Jews were apostatizing and others were dying the death of martyrs, They realized that the righteous character of Yahweh required justice. There had to be life after death in order to maintain the assertion that Yahweh deals fairly with humanity. But we also see that there was an element of relationship at work. The love of God is eternal, and because he seeks out intimate love relationship with individuals, It just doesn't make sense that someday this personal love relationship should die. He has put in us the longing to see him as he is, and we have to believe that the day will come when this really will happen. So what does all of this tell us about theology and identity? First, let me clarify that I am not suggesting that notions of love and emotion should be the basis of creating new doctrines or altering the historically understood authoritative teachings of the scriptures. 
Many seem to be taking that road, but I won't go there. What I am saying is that there are different ways that we arrive at an understanding of the truth. The teachings of the Bible don't just come to us as a list of formulaic doctrines. The Bible isn't just do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. What we've learned through our exploration of the Old Testament is that we must pursue relationship with God. When we do, he reveals himself to us. We might ask, why didn't Yahweh just tell the people, hey, there's life after death? In my view, the answer is that he wasn't just going to give them the answers to everything. They had to relationally pursue him. The lesson for me is that truth is not attained through the intellectual process alone. Truth isn't perceived only by means of cognitive reasoning and rationality. Some dimensions of the truth can only be discerned through the process of deep and intimate love relationship. So I believe that Hebrew theology and identity is about this. Find out who you are and find out who God is by pursuing love relationship. Don't look at faith just as an assent to a group of doctrines and ideas. Look at faith as a call to live in intimate communion with a God who is just, who is righteous, who is beautiful, who is overwhelming, who wants to reveal himself to humanity, and who wants all people to experience life in him and with him forever. And with that thought, we will bring this episode to a close. This is the final installment of Season 1, where we have been exploring the themes of theology and identity in the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm David Clark. I would very much like to hear your feedback and comments. Thanks for listening today, and be on the lookout for Season 2. 